after striving. I think of my father's one room wood shop, how his business sign eventually blew over beside apple trees and blueberry bushes. At church, men would ask, staying busy? He hated that question and kept adding logs to the stove and sanding doors. There was a time I'd stare at the grass in September and not think about the push mower. When work is over, I find his skin, his hips metronome while rinsing plates like it's joy he's practicing. We relearn simple math like dance because how long have we been striving and what has work numbed? When my partner and I got together, the worst of the pandemic was over and we were self-admittedly training ourselves to let ease and joy back into our lives. Culturally, we're encouraged to work late, live online, and pack optimal productivity into waking hours. The anecdotes to this mandate are living quietly and remembering our bodies as mechanisms for pleasure and joy. Like my father, who makes his living as a carpenter in an unmarked wood shop, tucked behind an old orchard. Sydney, Johnny, Indio, Swive, Hi. and company, welcome to Lo-Fi Lounge. Thank, Thank you for you. having us. Thanks for having us. We're happy and to be here. This is a momentous occasion, right? Because you guys uh, have been working hard. John just snapping the whip and and, <laughs> and, and great music ensuing. So I, I, I know it's been bugging over the last couple of days because I saw you guys having so much fun. I go, well... Uh, I'm not having fun here. Um, <laughs> Did you send part of songs or yet or anything? No, or? I, I'm not showing any songs until my producer tells me I can. I'm, oh, I'm sure. keeping a tight <laughs> lid on it because yeah. uh, you know these kids in this generation they just immediately <laughs> just start sending things out. Give everything away. Yeah, there's, yeah. there's an element of of surprise and of like a a record launch. And we were lucky enough at uh, at uh, Five Stock. It was the summer summertime, right? Or not really summertime, September-ish, right? September 11th. September 11th of all days. Uh, at <laughs> at Feistock, we were able to all get together and, and do some music at the at the lounge. And and we were able to see just how good this band was. The Swive, they were just uh, powerful and tight. Yeah, and and it, it, there was something supercharged about that music. And I, you know, I saw John's eyebrow go up, you know, when that eyebrow oh, goes. Eyebrows were going. <laughs> yeah. These things that yeah. uh, it really uh, was exciting then, and then more exciting that you guys uh, were going to start recording and that John was going to get be in this producer's role. So I've been watching from, from afar and just wanted to just, because you guys are just finishing the recording right now. You just finished like last night or something like that. Today, about so, an hour ago. Oh, okay, there we go. Last, Perfect time. That's overdubs. Today was, uh, Sydney is very organized with this. As you can see here, uh, she gave all of us these notebooks and uh, very, very organized. And, you know, we all have notes and things, but Sydney's are very, very she has, like, so but she has we have Swive, it has the date, it has the person's notebook who it belongs to, and they gave one to everybody. And then inside is like the song list, production notes, financials. I lost my notebook before I got back. <laughs> India lost his notebook immediately. I have mine, but it's like the notes are upside down and yeah. some of them are falling out. It's covered you in notes. I'm the same uh, absent minded professor that I was when. We well, work with you. <laughs> oh, absolutely. There's, there's a there's a madness in his method. Hey, <laughs> and said, "Okay, we've got this little group of last things that we want to do, and one of them was to add uh, our man Ben, who is a producer engineer in house here at Saint and Serpent, who is also a fabulous live and studio keyboard player. 
Oh, so wow. we thought, well, what are some songs we could bring Ben in? So we've been doing keyboards and uh, some backing. Even vocals. more specifically, he's an organ player, which is very hard. Oh, yeah. So he's been the B3. B and oh, B3. Oh. Yeah. With the Leslie and the whole thing. Like, really. He played some beautiful stuff on, oh, on some of our songs. Really and then also today, it's kind of been fun because we're at sort of at the tail end of what we absolutely have to have on the record. And now it's just fun. Uh, our bass player popped in and said, I got a vocal idea for this. So we got him on an extra backing vocal part. And he had a little guitar lick he wanted to add to one of uh, Indio's songs and a little guitar melody. And we all kind of went, mm -hmm. that's pretty good. And he wanted double bass on one of the songs. So we yeah, put a second bass track. Big, <laughs> big bottoms. Or it's just like, you know, so we're having fun now. It's like we've got all of the, 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 oh, the essence of the, yes. the whole record in, but now we're just having Today fun. Today I added the cowbell. Oh, yeah. <laughs> more, more. Did cowbell. the song need cowbell? I don't think so, but I wanted to have a cowbell on the record, so we do. <laughs> and the dangers that's happened on, on every album, uh, Brad Vaughn, the drummer, I'm always thinking he's kidding. He goes, you know, with the, this song, can you use cowbell? I go, I, I saw the skit. I know all about it. He goes, no, 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 really? And then... Uh, He's always right. It's not just to find the cows in the in the fog or whatever. So, how many songs did you guys uh, go after getting you know rolling into this? No, we got twelve done. Uh, we got a few more like basically done. We're gonna save them for the next uh, album. But we got uh, yeah twelve done, and we're really stoked. And uh, Johnny guided us through the whole process. It was super fun. Yeah, we had to prune three. That was really tough. It was yeah, so but, many good songs, yeah. and that and as I told uh, uh, the two of them, um, that having too many good songs is not a bad place to be. Quite often, you go to make a record, and there are four or five pretty good songs, and then a lot of not so much, you know. So <laughs> this one, it was it's really tough because the songs that we're setting aside for the next album are as good as the songs that we're using. So, but I I don't know personally. Uh, and we talked about this a little bit. I albums that are like 18, 20, 22 songs, I just don't think people have the attention span or the focus for that. Records that are nine, 10, 11 songs that are really great songs, it's easier to sort of focus on. Well, we only have four, 12 songs anyway. Yeah. <laughs> it's all self finance. Yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a spirit of. I, it's cool, Indio, that you're already thinking about the next record. I think that's really that's that's the heart of a real uh, writer and musicians and a band that's going to uh, continue. Take the credit for that. That was <laughs> that was definitely in conversation. But at the same time, they I they both I, have so many good I, songs. But I, I do appreciate that, and uh, yeah, I I intend to you know obviously like not just have one album. So uh, you know, yeah, going. well, yeah. but to get but to get that one album. And to and to like I said the the tough work Sydney of uh, narrating you know taking a song because they're all like our kids right you know I'm a I'm a new grandparent and so you know it it, it just sort of regenerated me about about you know the, these these little these little uh, darlings right that you know if you've written a song and you've committed to it just like you know over my cold dead body is I'm going to take yeah. out <laughs> basically yeah right. yeah I think that. The 12 songs we chose are all pretty much different from each other. And so that's what that's the cohesive factor is that none of them were very similar. And the three that we took out maybe had some more similarities to a couple songs. Of a uh, concept of right. no concept. No so, concept, concept or just pride. Yeah, you know, go ahead. Pop in there. Um, <laughs> yeah, just, uh, like there's like a spectrum of emotion that we wanted to capture, I think. And mm -hmm. um, we kind of honed in on what we wanted to keep. And uh, yeah, there's some sad songs oh, yeah. and some yeah. sad songs. <laughs> it's an emotional journey. Yeah. I always knew John could be a good producer, even in the oldest version of, of our band, you know, way back in the you know, 78, 79, when he'd come in with a new song or six, you know, I'd come to practice and go, I got, a, I got a songs. And then meticulously, John would say, okay, now we're going to play this. And he would start, organizing and setting it in you know in place what building blocks would take for the song to be successful you know as a song period in the arrangement of it and, and the details of it so was that your guys experience did you, how did john uh how did he work with you guys oh man i could branch on this uh sitting <laughs> go ahead i'll go uh 
um, I, I can't, it's almost abstract, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, I love working with uh, Johnny here. Uh, I actually um, happen to be uh, a large part of guitars because of him, so uh, it's de definitely surreal. But um, he's a mentor, extremely down to earth, and uh, yeah, it's it's been a, a complete pleasure. And uh, he describes things in an abstract yet logical way that mm -hmm. I can connect to, and uh, and the emotional context of it all like yeah it's it's uh i don't even explain it but just the uh, vocal parts and vowels and, and just tones and those kind of my they, they seem minute but the way uh they come across at the end actually does impact the song a lot and he kind of expressed that to me and uh yeah it's it's i've grown a lot just uh in this past week uh i would recommend anyone uh like work with him a little bit and kind of make some things yeah there you go it's, a complete treat. it's a good plug and i think you're right about he's a good looking guy too remember when uh, Johnny, I'm so used to calling him John because we're old. That's uh, fine. Yeah, I'm the only one. Only you, only you and my mom. Were the only people that could <laughs> right, down. right. Just in the old days, or even when you were recording uh, Palm Hinge over at the studio, um, when you would come in, you had your lyrics, and you had certain words underlined, and there was just certain details about how he wanted to hit a very specific word. And I would just... I come in and blah, 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 blah. I just sing what I sing and I go, <laughs> grab some of that that's good and just tell me what isn't and I'll sing that part nice. again. So what I like about your band and what you know what I heard in that first uh, a rush of sound was first I was in my in the the studio part. I mean I was in my little control room and I was hearing from outside. And, and immediately, you know, I'll think of uh you know what what references are there, you know. You know, well, what does this sound like a little bit? Like everything automatically, I it do that for me. And after about, you know, a two minutes, then I kind of exhausted all those things. I go, there's a lot of new things here in front of me. There's a lot of new uh, sound. There's, there was like an intelligence to it that then I walked out of my room and I rarely do. I'm always in my little control room. I walked out then I was watching you guys play and then I went back uh, to the back of the room and I was up on the side and there's just a lot of nuances already in your music and I'm sure John that's what you picked up on you see there, there's a lot of pockets of success yeah. waiting to happen right absolutely a real variety and they're both very strong songwriters and uh, quite often that's just an instant conflict in a band where um, not that we don't all have a healthy uh, competitive spirit with our bandmates and so on and so forth. That's a good thing. It's a positive. Right. But one thing I really uh, picked up on very quickly uh, was that um, they play wonderful supportive parts on each other's records. Uh, India will have a song and, and Sid is really coming in strong as the main guitar or the lead guitar player sort of on the song. And they do that for each other's songs. They're both very good guitarists. And they're both very good singers and they're both very good songwriters and they manage to make a sound together that is suave and yeah. charmed me immediately um there was one song and there's so many songs one of india's songs that was the first one to kind of pull my ear and go hey this song bad tendencies very pop and then immediately after that there was a song of sydney's called a race car driver and it, it's the same thing but the songs are relatively dissimilar from one another except that they're well-written pop songs but Sid's song is it has elements of almost like prog it changes uh time signatures and does these things that you're not used to it, no not many people are doing that right now right so right time signature changes and groove changes and scene changes that are a little more than just first course first course we're out right. not at all <laughs> Sydney <laughs> writes in a way that She's got a few songs that are that way and you never lose interest because she's singing a great melody and she's saying something that pulls you in. Uh -huh. And they're both such good songwriters, but they really complement each other's songs. And I just thought that that was really special and really unique. And they'll ask me, well, what's, there's so many good bands out there. What sets us apart? So I said, okay, you want a list? Um, <laughs> you're both great writers. You're both very, very good singers. You're both good guitarists. And uh, you make a sound together that is greater than the sum of its parts.
Will you wash your hands of all the common people at the end of another working day? Burning every bridge that you are crossing. Better pray to God you're not passing back this way. You throw your weight around like a wounded beast. As the humble and the silent gather around. Till this tower of Babel that you are building, it topples over and it knocks you to the ground. And the soldiers that you lead into temptation In ways that even you don't understand May obey, but it will be no indication Of the measure of a man Looking through the clouds of your illusion I am amused, but still have half a mind To tell you you can take your ways of living And you can stick them where the sun will never shine And one day when you own all the in China Sitting lonely in a castle dark and cold The memories of the ones you loved are buried In graves nearly as shallow as your soul May you recall the wrong roads you have taken and the ones who tried to make you understand That the measure of ambition and of riches There is no measure of a man This is Morse, your lo-fi lounge time machine tour guide. In February of 2013, Camper Van Beethoven had a band called the Black Marshmallows open for two Northern California shows. Black Marshmallows, like Camper, has its roots in Santa Cruz, and there was even a trivia question uh, regarding their shared musical history. Spoiler alert, the band that the answer was is Clutch Cargo, a jazz combo which shared members of both Camper and the Black Marshmallows. And yes, if you've seen me wearing a Black Marshmallows t-shirt, that's where I want it from. Uh, with such reality-based topics as Berkeley Pedestrians, Keith Richards' Longevity, the Occupy Movement, and Jefferson State, the Black Marshmallows' down-to-earth songs are rooted in shared experiences. Musically, I recall them being compared to a cross between television and Leonard Skinner. A uh, band I worked for used to distinguish between particular guitar styles as being more cordular or notular. Television's guitar sound... Uh, seems typically notular to me, and the Black Marshmallows have two guitarists, not three like Skinner, so I guess I don't really know where I'm going with that. But I wanted to throw in a television reference uh, in honor of Tom Verlaine, who died recently. May he rest in power. Um, if you don't know the band Television, you got to check them out. Um, I won't overanalyze the song Etch-A-Sketch, but suffice to say it's based on a metaphor. I will overanalyze the band's name, however. Um, mar marshmallows, actual marshmallows, when they're at their best, um, are cooked to a uniform blackness on the outside. Uh, for the longest time, I thought it was ironic, but now I realize that it's just delicious, like punk rock. 
When Chris pushes the big black button to send us back in time approximately 10 years to a former television studio, now operating as a club called the Rickshaw Stop in San Francisco, we will see and hear what happened. So, Chris, please take us then now, and until last time, I'll see you next time. Or vice versa. And vice versa. Maybe some of you probably don't know this. Roderick and I, after we were in college, we formed a jazz band, a fake jazz band, and we got a Victor Krimenacher and Jonathan Siegel to play in it with us. And a, you, a free t-shirt to anybody who can name what that band's name was. Okay, we got until the end of the night.
come from a broken home each and every morning might have traveled far alone each and every morning you because I need to set up down by the break of day Skies across the land. There's no master plan. Used to leave the door in me each and every morning. Man, that's part of history. Each and every morning. Nowadays, I'm not the only one in California sun. I could be your hammer down each and every morning. Quiet like the bluebird sound. Each and every morning, I could be the one to help you around. Each and every day. Till uh, Tom Verlaine and television, I was a rhythm guitarist and a raggedy one at that, but he played with such a precision and elegance and drive that it reformatted what I thought a guitar song could be. And I've sort of lived off of this format ever since we miss him already. My rhythm ain't 